Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the World Sepsis Congress uh, 2021. Um, my name is Luis Gorordo. I'm from the Global Sepsis Alliance in Mexico City, and I will be your chairman for the session number 14 that is in monomodulatory treatments in sepsis and severe COVID. Uh, I would like to thank everyone that make possible these uh, sessions. And I will introduce you with the first speaker of this, uh, of this session. That is Professor Dr. Uh, Christopher Seymour. He is an assistant professor in critical care and emergency medicine in the University of Pittsburgh in School of Medicine. He is a core faculty member of uh, the Clinic Clinical Research Investigation and System Modeling of Acute Illness Center in the Department of Critical Care. Dr. Seymour has received his uh, medical degree from uh, the University of Pennsylvania before completing the, his internship and residency in, in internal medicine at the Hospital of University of Pennsylvania. He uh, then completed his, his uh, fellowship in pulmonary and critical medicine at the University of Washington, and he uh, obtained uh, the master's degree in clinical epidemiology at the University of Washington Public uh, Health School. Dr. Seymour's uh, research program focuses on the development of early diagnosis and prognostic models to facilitate treatments, uh, treatments for those with acute uh, illness, particularly, particularly during uh, the pre-hospital and the emergency care. He is, uh, cur his current uh, founded research seeks to identify sepsis endotypes to target treatments in the emergency department. He has spent his clinical, clinical time um, attending the medical intensive care unit at the UPMC Mercy Hospital. Thank you, uh, Dr. Seymour, and let's hear your presentation. Sure, so uh, that was a long introduction. Uh, thank you and appreciate uh, the comments. Um, I'd like to thank the Global Substance Alliance and the World Substance Congress for the opportunity to speak. Um, we only get a short time together here, uh, and then there'll be some questions followed by some fantastic speakers after me. Um, so I was asked to speak a little bit about sepsis and severe COVID, in particular about how phenotypes or groups of patients um, may or may not matter to their treatment. Um, so we'll get into that. Uh, I'll just add a caveat that I do participate in the REMAP CAP uh, platform trial in COVID-19. Uh, and in some ways, you may disagree with what I share. You may not. Uh, but the interesting part for us as scientists is that there's no truth when it comes to this uh, discussion about subtypes or phenotypes. So uh, with our brief agenda, uh, before even talking about what phenotypes are, I am going to remind us again what sepsis is and what it might be talk briefly about uh, sort of this debate, um, is COVID-19 sepsis? Some people have written about this, but just to set the stage, because both subtypes and or phenotypes are being proposed for sepsis and for COVID-19, are they, are they actually the same thing? And then we'll talk a little bit about whether they matter for clinicians or patients. Okay, so this is sepsis three. Again, I'm just setting one building block here of the discussion we'll have. Um, it's important to note that in this uh, document, uh, the words that are used to define sepsis include uh, that it's uh, a dysregulated host response, it's a life-threatening organ dysfunction response to infection, and it really is the same criteria for everyone, uh, whether or not you're my age, uh, Professor Picker's age, or others uh, who are here listening today. Um, they're actually quite broad criteria. Um, so more specifically, organ dysfunction is at the sort of the center of these clinical criteria, and in particular, the SOFA score, uh, which is now almost 20, 25 years old. Um, I'll skip over Q, Q SOFA today, uh, but I sort of wanted to pull out this, uh, this conversation about COVID-19. Um, sort of the, the ask today was sort of blend these two uh, topics, and so um, here's my take on that. Um, is COVID-19 sepsis? Well, the, the important words uh, that are in the definition of the criteria are life-threatening, organ dysfunction, infection, and dysregulated host response. And going through this one at, one at a time, very simply, I think we meet all four of those criteria. 
Uh, this is a snapshot, I think, uh, from the CDC showing what many of us as intensivists uh, and certainly folks around the world know is that this is a life-threatening infection. Uh, many people are dying. They are, in fact, dying of the infection itself as opposed to other secondary infections. And that's just shown here in, in one of many graphs. Uh, organ dysfunction. Well, uh, there have been uh, reports, this is a, a schematic from Nature Medicine showing how the virus itself um, impacts multiple organs throughout the body, whether it's uh, sort of the brain dysfunction characterized by delirium uh, or even more clinically overt symptoms. Um, and essentially every organ in the body in this picture has some abnormality that has been associated with it, maybe not all in the same patient, um, uh, but due to the coronavirus. So we know this is, a, um, of course, uh, an infection. We know there is uh, life-threatening organ dysfunction here, even described by ICNARC, uh, the Data Coordinating Center for Critical Care in the UK. We can see the proportions of patients who are getting advanced respiratory res uh, support, uh, liver support, or renal support, and these are substantial amounts, um, proportions of patients who are having um, a threat to their organs as a result of this virus. So I think we're doing pretty well here. Um, I'll skip through infection. That's easy. And then when we get to this one, dysregulated host response, it's sort of hard to judge in COVID-19 because it's all new. Um, the, it's, it's sort of been interesting as the pandemic has evolved over the past year. So is our knowledge of the biology. Um, and you can see that early on, these are just actually headlines from the New York Times, uh, taken uh, probably back in March of 2020 in April, talking about this um, uh, sort of cytokine storm and robust inflammatory response uh, to COVID-19. Um, but this has been better characterized. Uh, and this is a beautiful paper that was in science, I think it was around the middle of August uh, when this work was um, reported, uh, showed um, sort of a multi-omic analysis uh, an investigation of uh, the different cell lines and, and how they are behaving in healthy donors, recovered uh, patients, as well as those with active COVID-19 disease. And the reason I show this picture is because uh, not all patients are the same. And not only are they presenting in different ways, but beneath the surface, the biology is quite different, such that some groups have an absence of um, uh, an inflammatory sort of quote storm and others where it's just might even be a breeze. So, I think these are all four check boxes and it's an easy start to the lecture. COVID, I guess said COVID-10, but COVID-19 there is in fact sepsis. Um, and so I, I think we can think about them collectively when it comes to a discussion of phenotypes. Okay, so this is the cartoon I like to use uh, when talking about phenotypes in sepsis. So on the left uh, is a gentleman who might be 40 years old with no comorbidities, who suffers a bout of influenza, develops secondary staph pneumonia, and is mechanically ventilated. Many of us have seen this patient in our ICUs. At the same time, on the right is an 85-year-old gentleman with some comorbidities. Uh, he has what the residents now call HEF-PEF, he has end-stage renal disease, suffers from biliary sepsis and is in shock. But the term sepsis would be in a blanket way applied to them both. And even some of our clinical practice guidelines for these patients. But of course, as I've outlined, they're different in their demographics, their host response, the site of infection, the actual pathogen uh, that's causing the trouble, the organ injury, and then even the host tolerance ability to tolerate, uh, the host tolerance to the pathogen. So, it's sort of curious why we might go ahead and think that the same treatment would be applicable to all of these patients. Um, not even mentioning the experience in other fields such as oncology, cardiovascular disease, or rheumatology where different patients respond differently to um, our therapeutics. So then to set the stage with semantics here, um, I like this these set of definitions. Phenotype, we're going to refer to as a group that has a set of clinical features um, similar to those uh, identified perhaps in a Berlin uh, definition for acute respiratory distress. Um, our colleagues have in ARDS actually have, have put forth the term sub-phenotype, uh, suggesting that these are patients that might share a risk factor, a trait, some uh, biomarker pattern, and that collectively those patients are more similar to each other um, than they are from others. Um, and finally, endotype is a word, uh, again, that's been proposed as a uh, a way of describing a set of patients that share a distinct biological mechanism. Now, this may not be uh, sort of the disease-defining mutation, um, but uh, but rather um, a sort of a consistent 
abnormal biology in a set of, in set of patients. So there's debate to this. Um, uh, I'd like to use the word subtype going forward uh, because I think there's less controversy. That is just a set of patients with some shared characteristic. So in sepsis are quite a few examples I didn't put all the citations here, but uh, there's some beautiful work in Tom Vanderpool's lab from the Mars Consortium and others, uh, Brendan Skakluna, who's used uh, transcriptomics to identify ways to group patients. There are others in Sam Brown uh, has used different um, uh, heat maps. Hector Wong's group in pediatric sepsis have looked at gene expression profiles uh, more broadly. And then there's even groups that have used um, knowledge networks to think of signs and symptoms that could mechanistically group together and then go in the data to see whether uh, those hypotheses hold. So um, I'm moving quickly here, but I think one of the most striking things uh, that we've noticed, and this is unpublished data, I think it's going to be um, in a JAMA viewpoint in just a few weeks, um, there has been a marked rise in the sort of splitting in this lumping splitting uh, framework in, of phenotypes across many syndromes and in particular COVID-19. Um, so you'll notice the x-axis on these two graphs. On the left, I've shown asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and sepsis. How over the past 50 years, there has been quite um, uh, minimal to no splitting of patients into smaller subtypes, uh, but really an explosion, an exponential increase in these groups uh, over the past 10 years. Um, at the same time, although a more compressed uh, pace, in COVID-19, we've seen a similar remarkable reporting of subtypes of COVID-19 that may be based upon clinical symptoms, abnormal coagulation, unsupervised clustering, maybe it was the immune phenotyping that we saw in the science paper, such that now more than 60 different subtypes of COVID have been reported in the medical literature. And the question is, what for and what do we do with these patient groups? So if we were lucky, um, we would have sort of output from our models that might look like this slide. Um, so these are uh, a variety of uh, statistical um, uh, cartoons that are showing groups of patients that might cluster through a hierarchical model or others. And ideally, these groups would have distinct boundaries. They would separate widely in, in, in whatever the features are you're, you're grouping your patients on. Um, but in reality, this isn't the case. And in fact, there's much overlap uh, and our boundary regions are, are full of all kinds of patients that we have uncertainty about. Um, this is a little bit from uh, what was called the Seneca study uh, that was at University of Pittsburgh and others uh, that was in uh, JAMA in 2019 showing using um, both latent class analysis as well as consensus K-clustering that patients can be grouped, uh, but there's uh, a lot of blending and you see that in the border regions in this T-SNE plot. Okay, well, there are ways to at least um, think about these patients as having different underlying biological mechanisms and clinical characteristics. And that was what was reported at least in this study. And again, this is just one approach to subtyping sepsis out of now almost a hundred different classifications. Um, I think I moved quickly through that, but um, uh, the take home message at this point is that sepsis is not all the same. Um, and that at least in Seneca, we have four clinical phenotypes. But there are many, many more depending on uh, the method, whether it's molecular uh, or uh, uh, multi-omic strategy uh, to separate your patient groups. Uh, these phenotypes have been correlated with clinical outcomes and host response. But the question I would have as a patient is if you give me this label because I have this set of characteristics, are you actually going to do anything different with me as a result of knowing that? And this is where sort of an, it's an interesting interface with what's happened in uh, COVID. Um, not only are there maybe 60 subtypes of COVID proposed, but there are hundreds, if not thousands of novel therapies or repurposed drugs that have also been proposed. And how do we blend this huge list of potential therapies with an ever growing list of potential subtypes to create sort of a precision strategy? This is a substantially difficult problem. Um, so one way of looking for um, sort of these subtype specific treatment effects would be in this sort of traditional heterogeneity of treatment effect evaluation, where this I think is the access, uh, so this is the, sorry, the process trial data, which is showing um, different resuscitation strategies, early girl therapy versus usual care on the left in black and gray, uh, showing that of course there was no difference in that large uh, multi-center randomized trial. But when you map phenotypes on the right, 
to that trial population, we can see that there was a differential effect uh, in the red panel versus the uh, purple and blue, such that in one group, perhaps aggressive fluids were associated with improved outcomes, whereas in the delta phenotype in the navy blue, um, those patients, uh, that phenotype who was sicker, did worse uh, with the aggressive early growing therapy. So this is hypothesis generating. Um, and just another example here, showing in different versions of a simulated process trial, moving left to right, depending on the proportion of phenotypes that are present in the trial population, the trial might've actually concluded for benefit on the left, that's the green bar, or a, a concluded for harm on the right, and that's the red uh, vertical bar. Okay, so knowing that phenotypes might matter uh, for precision treatment, either in sepsis or in COVID-19, the question is how do we get there? Um, and particularly in coronavirus, we've seen um, a just incredible pace of pandemic science, but also lots of stakeholders in the room. And I think to get to the end game, we need both government, industry, academic, uh, sort of our sponsors and philanthropists, certainly the patients, and even our journals, preprint servers, all collectively motivated uh, to this goal. Um, it, when one thinks about our uh, sort of the treatments as of yet found to be beneficial uh, in COVID, we see tocilizumab, cerulimab, things like glucocorticoids, maybe heparin in some patients or remdesivir. These are all identified from trials with rather crude stratification, meaning one marker, perhaps whether it's CRP or a clinical marker such as age on the front end um, that could uh, identify or enrich the population most likely to benefit. Uh, of course, these are just crude stratification methods. And that results from the fact that pandemic science uh, was had to be rapidly deployed. Clinical trial designs uh, were, were created and patients were enrolled in our platform trials before we even knew about the immune phenotypes that were published in August. Um, so these are some of the challenges we face. Um, and with that, I think I've tried to give a quick overview, although it was very short, about what sepsis is, what the phenotypes could be, and there are now hundreds of subtypes proposed, both in sepsis and COVID, um, and that their attachment to treatment is, is key to uh, these groups making a difference for patients. Um, and so with that, I'll conclude, uh, and I guess um, one thing I'd love to add uh, for my acknowledgments is that although many researchers uh, would be proposing what they call a clinical or a molecular, maybe an adaptive subtype of some syndrome, um, to, to sort of take uh, uh, our example from some colleagues in, in taxonomy, actually, what we are really ought to be looking for are reproducible, treatment responsive, clinically identifiable, non-synonymous, meaning not du duplicitous, and biologically plausible subclasses. And so I'd like to thank uh, certainly my mentor, Derek Angus, and a number of other folks listed on the slide for their contributions to this work. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for your insightful uh, presentation. Uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat, uh, and I will bet everyone to, to keep putting your questions over there. So this is one of the questions is how do we then identify the subphenotypes uh, or what are the characteristics? Okay, so um, in the case of sepsis, I, that's a hard answer because very few, if any, subtypes have been associated with the treatment benefit, so-called treatment response or predictive phenotypes. Those would be the ones that we'd want to lean in and identify sooner. I still follow clinical practice guidelines, which are to generally treat all patients the same, uh, but a number of systems are trying to take some of these uh, groups, map them into their electronic health records, and then understand how treatment behaviors are different, and then associate those with uh, changes in outcome. So more to come. Yeah, um, I, I like uh, one of your slides that says, if we were lucky <laughs> uh, of, of having these clusters of, uh, of phenotypes, what happens or, or what's your, your experience, your knowledge about the obese patient, the pregnant woman, the, the post-transplant uh, patient that doesn't have the same response? Is there something we can do with those populations? Yeah, so just like a clinical trial, most of the observational studies that might be sort of using machine learning or the like would be trying to focus in on the average patient as opposed to these um, outlier groups. Perhaps even the, uh, the end-stage liver disease patient with cirrhosis is going to have a different presentation of, of their sepsis just as a, as a pregnant woman. Um, 
So it's, it, yeah, it's not, I think, appropriate to take an alpha, beta, gamma, delta classification and say that's going to be um, applicable to ob obstetric uh, uh, patients. Um, uh, I think that deserves more work. Okay, I think there's, a, there's no more questions in the chat. Um, so I will thank you very much for your kind presentation. And uh, I will take uh, to the next uh, one. Thanks so much for having me, guys. The next presentation is uh, Dr. Andrew Khalil from the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, he is an uh, internal medicine uh, professor from Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami. And uh, his infectious disease and critical care medicine fellowship uh, were, were taken in the Harvard University from Massachusetts General Hospital and the NHS and NIH. He, uh, Dr. Khalil works as an attending clinician and, and researcher, of course, at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And he's currently the director of the Transplant Infection Disease Program at the same university and an associate director of the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit. And we're gonna talk, and he's gonna talk uh, for us about the Janus Kinase Inhibitor, inhibitor the, the jacking, in severe COVID-19. Thank you very much, much Professor uh, Khalil. Thanks, Luis. Uh, thanks for the organizing committee uh, for the invitation. So we'll, uh, we'll move along with, um, uh, you know, with the slides. So I think I can see uh, the slides very well here. So I will, uh, okay, I'm already live. So I have no conflicts of interest related to what we're gonna talk uh, for the next few minutes. This is uh, actually uh, 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 it fits perfectly with what you know what Chris mentioned uh, in the last uh, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, uh, these diagrams have been uh, posted in, in many, many articles in the last year or so, and uh, it seems to me that uh, it, you know based on, on, on what I've seen in my clinical practice, uh, it's really an oversimplification that we learned that with sepsis for the last 20 years. Uh, you know, we some patients are going to be immunosuppressed right off the bat. Some patients are going to have uh, immune suppression a little later, or, or you know, or inflammation regulation early, late, middle. So we, we have a lot to learn. I think that we have to be very careful about oversimplifying the process because that really can make much more difficult for us to evaluate uh, new treatments. Uh, so uh, it, this is really not what's happening on the bedside, even though it's it's kind of looks nice in a diagram in a paper, but uh, we have lots to learn. And one of the things that I'll mention to you, as you can see here, in this uh, paper is something quite unusual compared to other uh, viral infections is that uh, patients are having viral replication for two or three weeks. Um, uh, some are going to be just shedding the PCR, but some are going to be really having viable virus um, uh, at the lung tissue. Uh, so the reality here is very different from other you know, respiratory infections we treat before is that uh, it seems that um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 actually uh, can remain much longer, replicate much longer, uh, and maybe um, uh, be actually uh, causing much more of the uh, uh, dysfunctional uh, inflammation uh, because of this continuous high replication. So this is very important to think about because I think that in some ways this new infection uh, it breaks off from the old knowledge that oh you know viral just starts you know and then dies off everything's about inflammation and I don't think so I think there's a lot of uh, uh, conflation between viral replication inflammation even late in the course. Uh, based on what I've seen uh, treating my patients as well. Um, so the the goal here is to talk a little bit about uh, uh, Jack inhibitors, and uh, you know this is just uh, uh, a slide in which we uh, we can see a little bit of the uh, the whole process of the uh, Jack inhibition. Uh, you know, the this kinase inhibitors are uh, quite uh, uh, involved in the process of a uh, reducing the. Uh, uh, the you know kind of overriding, overwhelming uh, cytokine dysfunction uh, during a lot of other disease mostly has been used in uh, uh, rheumatic disease like rheumatoid arthritis uh, and so um, and some other chronic disease. So this is kind of uh, somewhat uh, novel for us on the ICU on the infectious disease field uh, because it has been mostly used in the rheumatology field. Um, the, uh, you know, the side effects that have been seen has been uh, what you'd expect from immunomodulators infections, 
uh, thrombotic events, sarcopenias. So, so these are the things that has uh, that we we have to watch very carefully when uh, we use these medications as well. Um, the the this is just a an example of uh, some of the uh, a pre-randomized trial uh, observational findings showing the. Uh, uh, you know, in patients who are infected with the SARS-CoV-2 that actually the use of uh, some of the JAK inhibitors um, led to a uh, improvement, at least uh, observational-wise, on inflammatory markers, uh, symptoms, and viral replication as well. So uh, that was kind of the building up process for us to understand uh, the evaluation of these um, JAK inhibitors in randomized trials. Also, the um, uh, the use of artificial intelligence um, uh, has, uh, in, in, you know, through you know hundreds of different drugs that potentially could uh, be successful in uh, in the clinical ground, uh, was uh, evaluated by this group. And Jack inhibition was one of the uh, the top findings for uh, this uh, this search. And so we, you know, after we finish Act One, that was the uh, uh, the uh, evaluation of Frandesivir versus placebo. Um, we moved to Act 2, in which we are looking for the combination. Once we found the clinical benefits with Brandesivir, we found that we it was time to potentially try a combination of the antiviral with um, um, immunomodulator. And, and so we decided to go for the combination of Brandesivir and Paracitinib. Uh, and so that was basically the design uh, of the uh, Act two trial, and what you know, and, and one thing that I want to just mention is why we chose baricitinib was you know we had many many discussions about which immunomodulator we we would use for uh, to test in Act two, and and we lo we looked for half life, so this is a very short half life, so it give us a little more uh, confidence about uh, safety um, uh, since this you know a lot of these immunomodulators can last for much much longer than days or weeks. Uh, so this is a very short half-life. Um, uh, we already had a very large database on safety on rheumatoid arthritis patients. Uh, we had a, uh, also the uh, possibility of inhibiting signaling uh, of uh, uh, COVID-19, including inhibition of the AP2-associated protein kinase 1, so something that uh, you know, was attractive as well. And we had the data from AI from the clinical utilization as well. So when you put all together, we, the group decided that um, uh, that was uh, the drug that we would evaluate in Act 2. And Act 2 had a uh, basically a, uh, uh, you know, mini, we had about 70 sites or so in different countries, uh, Denmark, Spain, uh, UK, Mexico, Singapore, Japan, South Korea, and mostly in the US. Uh, and we ended up enrolling about 1,000 patients in 53 days. Uh, that was our shortest uh, enrollment time that we had for uh, the Act trials. Uh, and then we uh, we published in December the preliminary findings, uh, and um, actually that was the final findings actually because we decided um, we had to really go for trying the full report at once, uh, and so uh, and that was really uh, quite um, a uh, impressive speed in terms of finishing up the trial and and getting uh, published uh, as well. So I'll just go for the next few minutes about some of the findings, the main findings that we had in this trial. So the primary point was uh, similar to Act One. We we looked for making sure the patient was able to um, leave the hospital, be home, uh, and, and be uh, not requiring respiratory support. So there was very much a clinical perspective in the sense that we want to make sure the patient is, is doing well and and not needing to be in a hospital. So that was uh, kind of the the primary point. And when you look into our baseline characteristics, we you know we found pretty much no change in terms of at least we found that the randomization was quite um, balanced uh, between arms in terms of age, ethnicity, uh, disease severity. I mean, important to know that we randomized based on disease severity and based on site. So there was a very good balance uh, in each site, not only by the site itself but by the disease severity. So that was something that we thought was really important because. As we know, um, COVID-19 has been treated very differently in different places. Sometimes even in the same hospital, uh, there are different ICUs and different um, uh, hospital wards that do um, uh, manage differently. So we, we, we thought that it would be very important to have this balance on the way that these patients were getting supportive care as well. Very, very important. And so the primary point was achieved was there was a significant uh, uh, faster recovery for patients that received paracetamib and when that's every overall was one day uh, shorter uh, on patients in the treatment group, uh, and and most of the uh, uh, most of the effect was found 
on the uh, in the group that was receiving high flow or non-invasive ventilation, in which there was a eight-day FASA recovery uh, for patients who received with the combination. So overall, very consistent you know, in speed in the recovery. But I wanna I wanna also complement uh, the, the the fact that we look into all the subgroups. Uh, you know, we look for um, again for age, uh, ethnicity, race, uh, uh, duration of symptoms. Uh, the disease severity at the enrollment of the, the study. And as you can see here, uh, most of the, uh, pretty much all of the uh, estimates here are uh, pretty much overlapping uh, within the uh, each other, uh, most in favor of the, the treatment between, uh, with, the, with the combination of investor and recipient. So that gave us a little bit the confidence that actually we are seeing uh, a uh, very consistent uh, effect uh, on the side of the combination therapy. Also very important, uh, at least, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, uh, when I treat my patients, when I'm at the bedside, is that there was a significant um, reduction in the progression for non-invasive inhalation and in the progression for invasive inhalation as well. So basically, there was a 30 to 40 percent uh, reduction, uh, significant reduction in the progression to intubation. That, to me, is remarkable, very, very important, tells us that actually uh, you know, if we can reduce by this amount, the amount of patients that we require intubation mechanical ventilation, that can have a very large impact uh, on, on the pandemic. Uh, and not only on the patient, but also on the way that we're going to prevent patients being intubated. We're going to actually allow the hospital system to uh, to actually to have more possibilities to have beds and to have avail availability for patients that actually need to be in the ICU as well. So this is a very important feature that I, I want to highlight. Also, right in the bottom here, you can see uh, with the two arrows uh, that also there was a 50% reduction on the uh, requirement for not only for new and mechanical ventilation, but also there was an 11 days, significant 11 days reduction on the duration of mechanical ventilation. So this to me was quite remarkable as well, because it tells us that if you can really reduce by almost two weeks, the time these patients are going to be, because as you know, we've we've seen in the, in the progression of the pandemic, patients now uh, stay much longer uh, when they require to be intubated. Uh, they really have a very long, very difficult course in the ICU. So the fact that we can actually cut uh, by 11 days um, when we use the combination, it, it means a lot uh, to reduce the exposure of the patients for long hospital uh, duration as well. And then uh, side effects wise, you know, we were, uh, we were really very um, uh, you know, very key of to uh, find uh, by making sure that this was safe it was the first time that the jack inhibitor was uh, was used in infectious process, and so we were you know really we had a, we had a very systematic, very comprehensive collection of side effects. And specifically, looking for infection thrombosis. These are the things that you see with these immunomodulators, uh, and as you can see here. There was no differences in the venous thrombolysis, and actually there was less significantly less infections. Um, in the patients that receive Barry and Rendesivir compared to patients that receive Rendesivir and placebo. So this is, uh, was also, uh, you know, a uh, somewhat a surprise because we expected to have similar or maybe more infections as we see with steroids, with other anti-inflammatories, but actually uh, we saw a lower, a significant lower rate of um, inf new infections in this patient. So that was definitely something that uh, uh, it was uh, very good to see. Uh, this is just to show at that time that we had uh, the only other trial that we had with anti-inflammatories was recovered, just to show the uh, uh, the magnitude of the uh, uh, survival benefits. When you look at patients in ordinary scales five and six, these are patients that will receive oxygen or high flow or non-invasive inhalation. Um, on the recovery trial, there was a significant 18% reduction on mortality. Um, on X2, there was a significant 53% reduction in mortality. So this is just to show that it seems that these are the, the patients that uh, have the potentially the most benefit from uh, these immunomodulatory uh, therapies in terms of survival uh, benefits. And this this just was just came out a few days ago as a uh, another trial uh, uh, that was the COVID barrier uh, sponsored by Lidi that uh, basically looked for baricitinib versus uh, placebo in a double blind randomized trial as well, 1,500 patients. Um, in, in different countries, mostly outside the U.S., uh, did not reach the primary outcome of uh, preventing uh, the progression to non-invasive or invasive mechanical ventilation, but it did, it did show a highly significant statistical significant reduction in mortality in patients that received Barry versus placebo, a 5% absolute reduction 
uh, on the uh, on the on the mortality of these patients received. Very interesting enough, about eighty percent of these patients received steroids, uh, and with or without steroids, they found uh, a uh, they found no difference on the effect of the uh, baricitinib uh, benefit on survival. There are two trials. Um, there are two trials that actually uh, uh, are being run. One, I think, is finished about another uh, Jack inhibitor. So we're going to have other Jack inhibitors being evaluated on COVID-19 as well. Uh, and just to conclude, I just want to mention that um, uh, baricitinib is the first Jack inhibitor to demonstrate significant clinical benefits in infectious disease process. So this is definitely something quite new. Um, the combination of Barry and Rendesivir uh, is the very first combination that actually shows uh, significant progression, a uh, significant reduction in progression to intubation and death in patients hospitalized. Uh, there was also, I think it's important to, to know that uh, this, it, it's the first Jack and Hip, it's the first immune modulator that shows less, uh, less secondary infections. That's very important for any immune modulation. And very importantly, when you look for both trials, the cough barrier and that too, we did not see any change on venous thromboembolism. That's something that we we're concerned initially. So we're looking forward to see other Jack inhibitors, but I think that this is the beginning of a new era in terms of a looking for different uh, types of immune modulation uh, in infectious disease process, in this case, a um, uh, viral disease. I will stop here and thank you very much for your attention. I'll be open for questions. Thank you very much, Professor Khalil. So there are a couple of questions here at the chat. Um, uh, first, uh, what's about the timing of the dosing of the, or timing of the treatment of these uh, immunomodulatory therapies? Is there a way to say this patient will benefit now or later and, and, and how we would do it? Right, very good question. So the, uh, it, you know, on, on, on our trial, what, um, you know, way that we, uh, the, the timing was basically the patients had to be Hospitalized. These are, you know, these are patients that require hospitalization. Uh, these patients had the diagnosis of, um, of, uh, you know, a COVID nineteen infection. Uh, they had pneumonia. They had hypoxia. Uh, so these are the patients that really are in that kind of, uh, you know, uh, moderate picture in which they are right in a hospital, uh, requiring, uh, you know, requiring supportive care. So this, this is the time that actually we start patients on bare and desiccant. So we had patients on. Uh, from uh, from being admitted without oxygen uh, to being admitted with oxygen or high um, uh, uh, or, or non-invasive inhalation or high flow ventilation, so all of them were included in Act Two. So basically, this is this is the way that the trial was designed, uh, and this is the way that we saw the benefit of Barry and Rendesivir. Uh, but but it's very important to realize that um, this this therapy was was given uh, up to fourteen days if the patient stayed in a hospital. If the patient left early. The patient would be, you know, they would, we would stop, so nobody would go home on immune modulation. I think this is very important because with any immune modulation, because uh, it, it, there is no safety uh, that uh, we, we have no safety data on patients that take these medications at home, and I don't think that would be safe for anyone to take these medications at home. Any of these immune modulators that have been studied in the last year or so, so these are definitely patients that um, are sicker, require hospitalization, are hypoxic. Uh, had, have signs of COVID-19 pneumonia, uh, and they will be receiving these medications only when they are in the hospital. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the, the, another question is, uh, how do you measure the effectiveness or the responsiveness uh, of the treatment? Is there a marker? If there is there something you can measure to say this is working or I should stop the treatment? So very good question. The, you know, the, what I would say that based on what we observed in the trial was really clinical improvement. So what, in based on my practice as well, what I've seen is that what you're going to see is in, with, you know, all these immunomodulators, they will remember, this is the immune system. This is not just killing the bug as we do with antibiotics. So even though we were given an effective antiviral like Lendesivir, um, it's, you know, the immunomodulator effect for any immunomodulator is going to take, you know, days to act because it, it's, it's literally, it's modulating the entire immune response to that virus. So um, what I would say is that what you're going to see normally in the next, you know, in the first two or three days is uh, that's the time that you're going to see a little bit of this improvement. So the, the patient is going to start to require less oxygen, is going to start to feel less fatigue, less tiredness. 
And so it's that kind of two, three, four days process for all these immune modulators. So it's something that really takes a little more time than the usual antibiotic or antiviral treatment. So it is a much more complex process to uh, deal with. Uh, but what I've noticed and what we've noticed in the trial, we've no, that's what I've noticed on the bedside, is that you're going to see clearly a clinical picture improvement, less fever, less fatigue, less dyspnea. Uh, hopefully, maybe we'll, uh, you know, we'll have markers. We have a lot of markers being evaluated now. We, we, we collected blood in all these patients in a sequential way, so we potentially going to have some markers that's going to help us to understand a little more if maybe there are biomarkers that can help us to know if the patient is moving in the right direction a little early, but uh, this data is still being processed. Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, both of the answers of the questions. I think we are uh, over the time now. Uh, I will thank you very much for your presentation and everything you thought uh, today. And now we're getting into the next, to a third lesson, session of, of this uh, 14 session in monomodulatory treatments in sepsis and severe COVID-19. And I will introduce you to uh, Dr. Diederik van de Beek. He is a professor in neurology at the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, he is in uh, 2004, he, uh, he started, successfully defended his thesis on bacterial meningitis. And after his postdoctoral time in the Mayo Clinic, in Rochester, he became the leader of the neuroinfection and neuroinflammatory group in Amsterdam. His uh, research focuses on bacterial meningitis, encephalitis, and infections after stroke and septic encephalopathy. He was uh, appointed as co-director of the Amsterdam Neuroscience Institute in, in 2016, and he is going to speak about anti-C5A in severe sepsis, uh, severe COVID and sepsis. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Van de Beek. So thank you for this very kind uh, introduction. Hello people. Well, in light of the current COVID situation, um, I will focus today on uh, the anti-C5A treatment in patients with severe COVID-19. These are my funding sources. I am involved in the uh, Inflarex uh, sponsored clinical trial on anti C5A in COVID 19, but I have no financial conflicts of interest. You've seen this uh, simplified uh, diagram. I like these simplified diagrams. I think COVID 19 has three pathogenic steps, and it's nicely shown. Uh, from the early infection, the start of the viral response phase to uh, an increasing self-propelling host uh, inflammatory response phase. And of course, difference differs between patients, but still um, patients admitted in the hospital with severe COVID are either in stage two and three, and many are suffering from this uncontrolled uh, inflammation and extensive coagulation. And today I will show you that the complement component C5A has an important role in the face of this disease. When the first uh, patients uh, with COVID were described in China, uh, we in Amsterdam uh, UMC, uh, University Medical Centers, decided that we should prepare clinical studies. And one of these initiatives, uh, we decided to collect as much as possible in a prospective study which is the Amsterdam UMC COVID-19 Biobank. We now have more than 100,000 samples of more than 1,500 patients, and you can freely use these samples. This slide shows the prognostic value of more than 80 serially measured blood biomarkers in COVID-19 patients, either on the general ward on your left and the ICU on the right. And the data are presented as hazard ratios per log to increase with 95% confidence intervals. We found several markers to be associated with, ink, with uh, outcome. As you can see, well, there are some of the usual suspects you heard about today, uh, but there are also several markers of endothelial dysfunction and regulators in the complement system. And C5A is among the top 10 of the prognostic markers for death in patients with COVID on the ICU. The importance of C5A 
in COVID is also illustrated by several translational studies. This beautiful study by Carvelli published in Nature uh, showed or compared inflammatory plasma markers between patients with different COVID stages. So patients with two or posy symptomatic, so little symptoms, had COVID pneumonia or the RDS stage of COVID. Again, IL-6 and C5A are greatly upregulated depending on disease severity. However, and I think that's very interesting of this paper, it shows the importance of C5A in a functional way. The C5A, C5A receptor axis showed to have a crucial role in attracting neutrophils, a hallmark of COVID-19 disease. And neutrophil attraction in this paper could also be blocked very effectively by a C5A receptor blocking agent. C5A has many detrimental effects that can be seen in COVID-19 patients, not only attracting neutrophils, but also damaging endothelial function, um, coagulation, and pro-inflammation. The avian influenza virus um, can also cause very severe pneumonia with histopathological features, as you can see here on this slide, uh, with HE pictures that are very comparable to that of COVID-19. In monkeys with avian influenza virus pneumonia, anti-C5A treatment by IFX1 or velobelimab decreases the histopathological damage as shown in a decreased HE score, <coughs> score uh, but also neutrophil influx, uh, IL-6 and TNF alpha levels. Interestingly, in this study, also viral loads were decreased by blocking C5A. So the complement component C5A is an interesting target in COVID. And this slide shows the activation of the final common pathway of this complement system. The classical, the lactin and the alternative pathway can lead to C5A cleavage, leading to C5A, of C5 cleavage leading to C5A and C5B that subsequently forms the membrane attack complex, which is crucial um, in the defense against bacteria. However, and that's very important, C5A can also be induced by the extrinsic pathway, for example, by thrombin, which plays an important role in patients with severe COVID. Eculizumab, uh, which you probably know is a monoclonal antibody that blocks C5, C5 convertase, so potentially decreasing C5A and C5B uh, levels, so the membrane attack complex. Importantly, um, this antibody leaves the C5A activation through the extrinsic pathway intact while blocking the MIC complex, crucial against bacteria. A proof of proof concept study investigated the use of eculizumab in patients with severe COVID. Importantly, that's important to realize, it was a non randomized study and they used high dose eculizumab, which was even increased during the study after a protocol amendment. Because of the potential infection risk, all patients were vaccinated and received preventive prophylactic antibiotics. But the survival difference, even in a non-randomized study, was impressive. However, and that's perhaps not surprisingly, with the knowledge I explained to you, treatment with eculizumab was associated with more than a double risk for infection, mainly ventilator-associated pneumonia, um, which was 51% in the eculizumab, 24% in the uh, control group. So very high dose of eculizumab might have a favorable effect in a non-randomized study, but increases the risk for infections. We can also very effectively block C5A. IFX1 is an antibody that neutralizes C5A already present and also blocks all C5A production inst instantly and it leaves the membrane attack complex intact because it only blocks C5A. Uh, 
in the early phase of the COVID pandemic in wave one in the, in the Netherlands, we performed a multi-center phase two randomized open label trial. We compared IFX1 plus standard treatment versus standard treatment without IFX1. To evaluate safety, we randomized 30 patients. Besides safety, the main outcome was the ratio of the arterial oxygen, oxygen pressure um, and the concentration oxygen by the air. And the, this shown here on this slide showed no effect of treatment. However, uh, IFX1 seemed to, seem to protect against pulmonary embolism, kidney failure and death. In A, you can see the serious adverse events. Uh, first of all, you can see that the number of infection is similar between groups. In the control group, pulmonary embolism was reported in 40% of the patients, 13% in the control group. 30% in the IFX treated group. Laboratory invest evaluation of patients included in the study suggested that this was mainly driven by an increase in fibrinolysis, which is expected when you block C5A. At day 15, we found a difference in kidney dysfunction in favor of the IFX1 group. And for intubated patients, there was a trend of survival in the treatment group. None of the IFX treated patients died due to multi organ failure. So, based on these promising results, two phase three studies were designed with this C5 anti C5 antibody. These studies are currently being performed in multiple sites in 12 countries. I'm involved in one of these studies, the phase three part of Panama, which is sponsored by Inflarix. This is a placebo controlled trial comparing. Um, IFX1 with placebo. And we aim to include 360 uh, selected intubated patients and the primary outcome measure is 28 mortality, 28 days mortality. So to conclude, NTC5A treatment showed to be beneficial in monkeys with severe viral pneumonia. I showed you that the serial levels of C5A predicts predict death in COVID-19 patients on the ICU. And translational studies showed the importance of C5A in the pathogenesis and the potential impact of anti-C5A treatment. One phase two study showed that anti-C5A is safe in COVID and it seems to protect against pulmonary embolism, kidney failure and death. Results of two large phase three trials are pending and I think these trials will answer the question whether patients indeed will benefit from anti-C5A treatment. This was my talk. I'm uh, happy to take questions. Thank you very much uh, for your kind presentation. Um, there's a lot of information to, to digest uh, from, from these th therapies. I, I want to ask you a couple of questions from the chat. Uh, uh, are these uh, the same question as the last uh, session? What's the proper timing to start the treatment? Is uh, when the patient is uh, with uh, a severe but not ventilator, uh, with the ventilator, uh, or in every kind of patients, which is the patient that will benefit more with this uh, novel therapies? Yeah, that, that's a crucial point, and that's crucial for all these treatments in uh, COVID, I think. And uh, so if you, um, um, uh, if, if you check the data from the phase two trial, it seems to be that both groups can benefit, but the, 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 the most of the benefit perhaps can be um, expected in the severely ill patients. So uh, that's why we uh, decided to, uh, to trial this, uh, this medication in intubated patients. If you, uh, when, we, when we made that decision, uh, we didn't know the results of our serial measurements. And uh, if you look at that, it might have role in, in both phases of disease. Do you think this, uh, this uh, anti-C5A 
uh, could work in a non-viral infections like bacterial infections or fungi infections? I, I think so. I think it's an all unexplored area. I mean, um, I'm involved here because, well, we, we, we do bacterial meningitis research. I'm a neurologist, um, uh, also doing infections. Um, I think in pneumococcal meningitis, it, it would be very interesting to test. I mean, but that's a bacterial disease as well. But I think in all diseases or many diseases where inflammation and coagulation plays an important role, this might be a potential treatment. Of course, you should be careful with that, but it should be investigated. I mean, it's an all new area, field of research uh, um, in, uh, from a clinical perspective, I think. Well, thank you very much for your kind presentation. And there's a lot of uh, things that I'm sure we will learn in the near future about this uh, kind of therapies in a viral infection and other kind of infection. Thank you very much. And now will we jump to the next uh, presentation. This, uh, this uh, topic is anti-complement therapy against COVID-19. And I will introduce you to Dr. Courtney Campbell. Um, she, um, she is a fellow in cardio-oncology and amyloidosis at Washington University in St. Louis in uh, July 2021. <laughs> Dr. Campbell is uh, passionate about advancing the care of the patient at the intersection of cardiology and hematology oncology, truth leading projects uh, and mentoring trainees and clinical translational research. Um, she has uh, published a topic on uh, circulation, the Lancet, and a, a lot of uh, other uh, major journals that obviously we know and we have learned about her work. Thank you, Dr. Carney Campbell, and the slides are all yours. Thank you for that kind introduction. So um, I am currently at The Ohio State University, and um, thank you for the invitation to speak at this World Sepsis Congress. So I'm gonna be speaking um, more broadly on anti-complement therapy against COVID-19. Here are my disclosures, um, research related as well as some consulting. And then outline, I'm going to just give a brief overview of complement pathway physiology, how it's dysregulated in disease, and then the connection between complement and COVID. Looking at dysregulation, some animal models, uh, the candidate therapies, uh, some of the early published data, and then the ongoing clinical trials. So complement pathway, um, as we've already just heard, uh, it's a mediator of the innate immune response. So primarily promoting inflammation, um, defending against bacterial infection as well as viral. And it can be activated through three primary pathways, the classical triggered by antibody antigen complexes, the lectin pathway uh, where it's related to binding of mannose residues on the pathogen surface, and then the alternative pathway which is stimulated by specific surface antigens and as well can be self-amplified. So um, the main mediators of the inflammatory component is C3A and C5A, as we just heard, in the recruitment of um, monocytes and neutrophils, as well as cytokine response. And then the membrane attack complex, the C5B9, uh, that can result in cell destruction. So, Complement is dysregulated in disease. Um, the hallmark of this and how I got involved is atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. Um, but there's also glomerulopathies, paroxysmal, nocturnal hemoglobinuria, as well as dysregulation and antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So AHUS is rare, about two in a million. And it is hallmark clinically is diffuse thrombotic microangiopathy. Primarily, this is the kidney, um, but we have seen it as well in the heart. And it's typically, there's an underlying genetic component or an inquire, acquired autoantibody against genes that regulate the complement pathway that are listed here. The prognosis was incredibly poor with almost 50% mortality in patients that had this. Almost all of them developed end-stage renal disease prior to occluzumab therapy, which is a monoclonal antibody that targets the C5 component of this common complement pathway. Um, patients that are treated with it though, do have organ recovery. Um, we have seen people come off of dialysis and um, even recovery of heart failure. And um, this was all just less than a decade ago and the first studies were published um, back in 2013. 
So this diffuse um, thrombotic microangiopathy is something that we do see in fatal COVID-19 infections and has become a hallmark, at least in um, a section of patients with severe COVID. So these are autopsy um, uh, histopathology, uh, four different patients showing examples of these pulmonary microthrombus. And then as to what causes the microvascular thrombi in COVID, there are quite a few different theories. Some related to direct viral injury, promoting of endothelial cells, promoting thrombi, hypoxemia injury, um, promoting expression of tissue factor and initiating coagulation cascade. And then what we'll focus on here is the complement cascade. As we said, the inflammation induced by C3A, C5A, um, you can get the neutrophils and the neutrophil extracellular traps, which are predominant in COVID, um, as well as the membrane attack complexes that can um, induce endothelial cell injury and promote thrombosis. So as far as complement dysregulation, there is quite a bit of evidence, and I'm just gonna highlight a couple of um, data points. These are um, high serum levels of both the um, serum C5B9, that membrane attack complex, and moderate and severe COVID-19 versus healthy controls. You also see the elevation here um, of the C5A, moderate and severe versus healthy controls. We can visualize evidence of um, the C5B9. This is immunohistochemistry of the intraalveolar septi in COVID-19. And um, this is definitely distinct from what we see with classic acute respiratory distress syndrome, suggesting that at least in a subset of patients, um, complement can be profoundly dysregulated. So even before this pandemic, uh, people were investigating the role of complement with coronaviral infections. And here are just two examples of um, ant mouse studies. So in a mouse that was lacking the C3 a gene knockout, when they were infected with SARS-CoV-1, um, they had no change in the viral load, but an improvement of lung function and a decrease in the cytokines. In a similar study with a mouse that was infected with MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Coronavirus, they were treated with an antibody against C5A and saw a decrease in viral load and cytokines, as well as an improvement in lung function. So with this data, this leads us to the anti-complement therapy against COVID-19. So I have highlighted the various treatments that are being investigated. The ones that are in red are at least FDA approved in the U.S. for um, um, complement related dysfunction, not necessarily, not, none for infectious disease, but those are cluzumab and revoluzumab that all target C5A. There's a small molecule as well, cycloluplan, that um, targets C5A. We just heard about IFX1 doing the C5A, C5A and then um, there is another antibody that's targeting the C5A receptor. There are also a couple a little higher up in this complement cascade uh, targeting C3, that's Amy 101 and APL9. And then I'm gonna go a little more in depth into classical and um, C1, and actually one of the regulatory proteins, which is C1 esterase inhibitor. So C1 esterase inhibitor is, um, is used clinically for hereditary angioedema, but um, biochemical studies have suggested that it can, uh, interacts directly with SARS-CoV-2. So C1 esterase does a lot more than just affect C1 in the complement cascade um, and can play a role in regulating um, the alternative as well as the leptin pathway. It's key for the plasminogen to plasmin in the fibrolinolytic system, as well as the um, as well as the development of bradykinin in the contact system. So this is another potential candidate. Um, and so now I'm just gonna go into some of the examples of early published results, which um, a couple of which were highlighted in the previous talk. So um, the occluzumab, the largest study that's been published so far, looked at 80 patients, 35 of which were treated with occluzumab. You saw a big difference in survival or significant difference at 15 day survival, 82 versus 62% but with the caveat that they do have, did have increased ventilator-associated pneumonia as well as bacteremia. Um, another study compared the C5 inhibitor, um, occluzumab, with Amy 101. These were just um, compassionate use, comparing um, data they had on these patients, 10 versus 3, and they did see sustained anti-inflammatory response and improved oxygenation. Um, but they saw a more profound decrease in the neutrophil extracellular traps with the Amy 101 
suggesting maybe higher up on that complement cascade, you decrease some of the inflammation that you get from the C3A contrib um, contribution. Uh, for the C1 esterase inhibitor, Conicet Alpha, five patients were treated, all recovered. And then as we just heard a great exp um, from one of the leaders of the IFX1 trial that demonstrated safety um, and our first randomized control style of anti-complement inhibitor and had some uh, very promising data when it came to decreasing pulmonary embolism, mortality, and renal function. And to give everyone an overview of what is currently in the pipeline and ongoing clinical trials, so these are the randomized trials um, targeting the C5 and C5A. Um, the majority, all of them are for severe COVID-19. Um, the ranging number of patients is anywhere from 32 to 360 and one even over a thousand. Um, one is targeting a subset, severe COVID-19 with um, renal dysfunction, AKI, and evidence of TMA. And um, one other is targeting COVID-19 and patients with advanced cancer. Further up their uh, complement pathway, there are a couple of trials or a few trials looking at the C3 inhibitors, um, AMU-101 and APL targeting C3. And then three trials looking at the C1 esterase inhibitor. And one of those is actually um, just now enrolling for um, post-COVID syndrome to see if there is an effect on um, those lingering symptoms. So with that, I'm gonna summarize, um, you know, complement pathway dysregulation results in diffuse inflammation and microvascular thrombi. This is similarly reflected in certain severe cases of COVID-19. Um, a lot of anti-complement therapy is available, either investigational or approved for other indications. The early data is promising, and there's many randomized trials that are ongoing, and hopefully we will see that data soon. So the last is I'll leave you with some of the questions that will hopefully be answered by these trials is, will it improve mortality, reduce illness duration, decrease thrombotic events? Um, a lot of this early work has been published before we had standard of care with things like remdesivir, dexamethasone, and a few of the other drugs in the pipeline. So will that be synergistic or not? Um, when do we start? What's the most effective target? Um, was infection risk going to be too high for other infections? And then the last is, um, will it be effective for any patient or only those with a genetic predisposition, as we see with atypical HUS? Um, and actually, a paper was published last week <laughs> from a group in Greece led by Dr. Gravelaki that looked at 100 patients with severe COVID-19 and almost half of them had um, mutations that are known to predispose to atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. So it suggests that there likely is um, a genetic predisposition to severe COVID along those lines. And that subset would potentially benefit from more precision anti-complement therapy. So with that, thank you. Um, and that's my contact information, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Professor Campbell. Um, cool. I think we have uh, no questions in the chat, but I would like to ask uh, about uh, how do we measure the responsiveness of the patients of, or response of the treatment in this uh, broad kind of patients we have, uh, not only COVID-19, but and other vital infections I just, as you stated? Um, I think as far as measuring the response, the most rapid way we have is just clinically on whether they're improving with the oxygen status. Um, I think it's difficult, um, at least from a lab standpoint, to really get quick turnaround on measuring things like complement levels. That's not something that's typically available in most clinical labs has to be sent out. So um, I think clinical recovery is really what we have to go on at this point. Okay, well, thank you very much for your uh, insightful presentation. Uh, I think we take home a lot of messages from here. I will introduce now to uh, Dr. Evangelos Yamarelos. Uh, he's gonna speak about the marker guided immunomodulatory therapy in COVID-19. Um, he's a professor in internal medicine and infectious disease at the Medical School of the National and Capodistrian University in Athens since 2018. His main research contribution is immunomodulatory in sepsis and autoinflammatory disorders, and he is chair chairing the Alenic Sepsis Study Group, uh, 
and he is uh, currently serves as the president of the European Shock uh, Society and the chairman of the European Services Alliance. Thank you very much, Professor Gemarellos. Uh, the, the, the slides are all yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to speak this uh, evening about uh, immunomodulation therapy for COVID-19. And I would like to introduce today uh, the concept of using biomarkers to guide therapy and to do what we anticipate, which is what we use and we would like to see in our patients, which is the personalized approach. This is my conflict of interest for this presentation and allow me to go to uh, this uh, publication of our group, which appeared uh, last June uh, at Cell Host and Microbe and uh, actually, the idea uh, was what is distinguishing between patients who are uh, at a situation of arriving at hospital with pneumonia and patients who uh, arrive at hospital but not with pneumonia which is self-resolving, but actually with pneumonia that will progress, with pneumonia that will lead sooner or later to ARDS. Some of you have already seen the publications, and the publications are telling that one of the major problems that we have is that if you get the entire variant of COVID-19 and you try to stimulate with this variant the immune cells, you will not get an adequate cytokine device. But however, we know already that COVID-19 is a situation where many of uh, people have described as a cytokine storm. And then the question comes, where does this cytokine storm come from since COVID-19 itself cannot stimulate an adequate production of cells from the immune system? So the question comes, Let's assume that the cell of, destroys the lung. And once the virus destroys the lung, this leads to the release of cell constituents, which we know as allermins. So these allermins, they may stimulate the immune cells, and this may lead to respiratory dysfunction. So the question is, if this is the situation, that means that the patients who eventually, after eight days of arrival at hospital, are those that are, are under the stimulation of allergens. Can we find a biomarker that demonstrates? These are data coming from Greece from the beginning of the pandemic, only of course 57 patients. And you can see there the patients in red for patients who, when they arrive at the emergencies, they have the concentrations of the biomarker with the name SUPAR, the acronym SUPAR, above six are those who will eventually be deteriorated and who will develop the ERDS. However, as you see, the patients who do not have these high concentrations of SUPAR, they do not develop. However, someone could say, okay, this is a very preliminary data. These are coming only from 57 patients. Do we have more data? And the answer is yes, we do have more data. These are the, this publication from uh, Chicago on 352 patients showing that what, for every unit of increase of SUPAR at the admission, there is an increase of the odds ratio for mechanical ventilation of almost threefold. So the question comes. We are in front of the patient. The patient has pneumonia, but the patient has not yet hypoxia. He has not yet respiratory failure, but the biomarker support the signal of the threat that the patient will sooner or later arrive at the ventilator is high. What can we do to this patient? With this in mind, we have developed what we call the safe strategy. That means this is a phase two trial. The results have recently been published at the life. Patients with pneumonia by COVID-19 
And with levels of support, six or more, they, we start treatment with Anakindra, 100 milligrams, sub-Q, once daily for 10 days. We used for this patient as comparators, patients hospitalized on the same time period and receiving exactly the same standard of care and hospitalized at university departments. Actually, this is the flow. Pa patients who are already on mechanical ventilation, patients who are already on hypoxemia are, not, are excluded from this study. So we have 130 patients, as you see the flow chart in red in the right panel, who received subcute treatment with Anakindra. And by using a propensity score matching from all the available comparators, we select a similar number of patients having eight similar strata so that they are exactly alike. Which are these strata? Patch to score, PSI, SOFA score, WHO severity, and also age, comorbidities, and treatment with dexamethasone, azithromycin, and hydroxychloroquine that was at the beginning of the day. This is the table of the comparison between the 130 patients receiving standard of care treatment with an and 130 receiving treatment only with standard of care. As you may see, no differences in demographics, in baseline severity, in uh, WHO classification severity, and in comorbidities. And as you may see in this slide, there are no differences in the baseline laboratory values, red blood cells, lymphocytes, CRP, procalcitonin, ferritin, respiratory ratio, but also no difference in co administered antibiotics, no difference in the rate of co-administration of remdesivir and dexamethasone. So the primary endpoint is the incidence of severe respiratory failure of the need of ventilation after 14 days from start of treatment. This is 59.2% in the standard of care group. It goes down to 22.3% in among an akinra treated patient. And then the question comes, how about mortality? As it is anticipated, mortality follows that. Mortality among an akinra treated patients after 30 days was 11.5%. However, it was 22.3% double among standard of care treated patients. However, as you have, uh, are already aware of, in the majority of trials for COVID-19, the primary endpoint is suggested to be, prepared, to be presented by the WHO scale. So WHO scale tells the allocation of patients as dead or severely hospitalized, moderate hospitalization, or at home in green. And you see how pay the allocation is shifted towards an expansion of the green and of better outcomes when there is treatment with anemia. And someone could say, could we have some biomarker indexes? Why there is benefit coming from an anemia treatment? In red, our patients treated with Anakindra. In blue, our standard of care receiving patients. The comparisons are on day one, a bit before start of treatment, and seven days after start of treatment. Surprisingly, our biomarker, SUPAR, after seven days, is increased among Anakindra treated patients. The signal of danger is increased, yet the patients are doing better. Lymphocytes after seven days go up. IL-6 after seven days go down. And two markers of macrophage activation, soluble CD-163 and soluble IL-2 receptor go down with an treatment. We presented these findings on November 30 in the Emergency Task Force for COVID-19 of the European Medicines Agency. We seek advice for them for a randomized five bottle clinical trial with exactly the same design, but with one arm receiving placebo plus standard of care and another receiving an akinra plus standard. 
The primary endpoint is the 11-point WHO ordinal scale by day 28. The trial has finished enrollment with 606 patients being enrolled until end of last March in Greece and Italy. And we anticipate the readout of our results as a confirmatory outcome by the end of April. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you very much for the kind invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jamalalos. Um, I think there's uh, no questions in the chat, um, but if you uh, could chose just one or two of these uh, biomarkers, which one would be and, uh, and when to use it, how to use it, how to, how to measure it? Uh, so the idea is that when the patient arrives at the emergencies, you get blood from him and you measure support. This is a point of care testing something like troponin or something like blood glucose. Once the levels are more than six, this, in our opinion, is the patient who should start immediate treatment with sub kindra with the aim to prevent progression into acute respiratory dysfunction. Okay. So uh, I think there are no more questions here. Thank you very much, Dr. I do thank Angelo you. And I will now introduce uh, the last speaker of this uh, 14th session. Uh, this is Dr. Peter Pickers. He's an intensivist, internist and intensivist professor of experimental intensive uh, care medicine. His research is focused on modulation of the innate uh, immune response and traditional models of and patients' septic, uh, sepsis and specific organ dysfunction. He, he has contributed contribute, uh, with a lot of uh, PhD students and uh, published hundreds of articles that we have uh, read some of them. And he is the principal, uh, principal investigator of the Stop Acne Trail. I'm sure we will learn more about it in the near future. Dr. Uh, Peter Pickers is going to talk about biomarkers for ass assessment of the AMD targeted treatments. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pickers. Thank you very much for your very kind uh, introduction. Uh, indeed, I will talk about adrenal model and targeted ter treatments, and I will give an, uh, an introduction first. So we know that in patients with sepsis, we try to uh, cure the infection by early treatment with antibiotics or source control with surgery. But if the patient does get worse, we actually only give symptom treatment with fluids and we treat organ uh, that are dysfunctioning. Uh, we give organ support. But the uh, actual reason for this getting worse of the patient is uh, capillary leakage that is increasing the shock and the decreasing organ perfusion. And we have no drug that could actually target that. So adrenal medulin is an uh, endogenous enzyme uh, protein a hormone uh, that is induced by several factors that are depicted here. And as you will recognize is that these factors, endotoxin, cytokines, et cetera, are all present in sepsis patients. So that's why sepsis patients are an interesting cohort uh, to look for adrenomedullin kinetics. And indeed, in observational cohorts, it was found that in sepsis patients, uh, adrenomedullin is elevated, and especially in those patients that do need a vasopressor later on. So adrenomedullin precedes shock and is a predictor of shock. And indeed, it is also related to impaired outcome. So uh, mortality is higher if bioADM is higher, again, related to the presence of shock and the development of shock. And this is also an active process. So if you start out with a low uh, concentration and it remains low, you're doing pretty well. But if it's high or low, but it gets to the high group, then survival is much less. Now, how does it work? What is andromedullin doing? So this uh, hormone is inside of the circulation and actually it has a beneficial effect on the endothelial barrier function. So it improves capillary leakage, is less capillary leakage. So this is a beneficial effect. 
At the same time, it can freely diffuse over the vascular wall. And when adrenomedulin is close to vascular smooth muscle cells, there it has a vasodilatory effect. And this can actually aggravate the shock. So this is a detrimental effect. So if you would want to use adrenomedulin and the beneficial effects on the endothelial cell wall uh, and infuse it, this is actually a problem because blood pressure will decrease because of the effects on the vascular smooth muscle cells. So this is something that cannot be done or is not helpful. It has positive effects on the endothelial cells, but also detrimental effects. Uh, so it is not useful to infuse this. Well, you can ask, is this possible? Uh, to modulate this pathway and retain the beneficial effects and at the same time do not have these unwanted effects on the smooth muscle cells. Uh, and therefore, uh, different compounds were investigated. So the company actually uh, produced and developed uh, antibodies directed against different epitopes of the hormone. Uh, and what was found was that uh, the uh, antibody that was directed to the C-terminal of the hormone completely inhibited its action. So the C-terminal is actually connecting to its receptor, and if you have the antibody on it, it's not working anymore. But if the antibody is directed against the N-terminal epitope of the hormone, then there is no inhibitory effect, uh, effect. so it's only binding the hormone, but it can still uh, bind to its receptor uh, and have its action. Now, what was interesting in the survival studies in animals, that it was this non-neutralizing antibody that was associated with the best survival in these animals. And this is something very special because most of the times, the, an antibody is actually neutralizing the effects of the compound it's binding. But in this case, it's only binding the adrenomedulin, uh, not inhibiting its action, but still having an improved survival. So how can we explain these observations? What we think is happening is the following. As I said, adrenomedulin is inside of the circulation as well as outside in the interstitium close to the vascular smooth muscle cells. If the antibody is infused, the antibody is actually contained into the circulation because it's a large molecule. So it's binding the adrenomedulin hormone there, uh, and at the same time, it is actually draining the uh, interstitium, uh, and so adrenomedulin that is free diffusible over the vascular wall is contained into the circulation. And we know that because if you infuse this antibody, there's an acute rise in the bioADM, the adre adrenomedulin concentrations that are measured. So inside this uh, circulation, uh, the uh, adrenomedulin can still bind to the endothelial cells and as it's non-inhibiting, still have the positive barrier function effects there. And at the same time, because the interstitium is drained from adrenomedulin, it does not have the negative effects, the vasodilatory effects on these uh, smooth muscle cells. So it's also beneficial for the shock in these patients. So following a large amount of positive uh, animal studies, it was decided to perform a phase two trial in septic shock patients. And of course, a phase two trial, the primary endpoint was uh, the safety and tolerability of the uh, antibody, but also as uh, secondary objectives, we looked at efficacy data. So what we did was we had patients with early septic shock within 12 hours, and we selected those patients with an elevated bioADM concentration, because these are the ones that are much more likely to have an impact outcome. And also, this is uh, the pathway that we want to modulate, so we want that pathway to be activated. We compared two doses of adrezuzumab, the antibody, against placebo, looked for safety, but also for efficacy up to 90 days. And what we found was the following. First, safety. As you can see here in red, these are the number of side effects uh, reported in placebo patients, and this in the two milligram per kilogram and the four milligram per kilogram adrezizumab dose groups. And as you can see, there are no differences in the side effects. So this uh, compound has a very good safety profile. 
So the next thing was, is there any clue for efficacy? And we looked at uh, SSI points related to being dependent on the vasopressor and invasive mechanical ventilation. And as you can see, atrezizumab might tend to be a little better, but this was far from being significant. And if we depict this as in a way that is more common using the increase or decrease in SOFA score, you can see that in those patients treated with placebo, they get worse before they do get better in the next couple of days, while in the treatment groups, this worsening was not present and also the improvement uh, was still there. And this difference was significant for the first day. Mortality was not significantly different, uh, although the uh, adresizumab curve was laying uh, above the uh, placebo curve. And if you look at the different dosing, uh, it, it suggests that maybe the four milligram per kilogram dose, the high dose is doing a little bit better comparing to the lower dose of adresizumab. So this was the uh, a priori defined uh, phase two trial. Now this talk is about biomarkers and how we can use biomarkers to enrich patient populations to see which patients might be more likely to benefit for a treatment like this. So the next biomarker I would want to shortly introduce is DPP3. This is a biomarker that is not related to bioADM. Uh, this is an enzyme that is in the cells. Uh, and this enzyme is able, if it leaves the cells to and there's spillover uh, to the circulation, uh, to cut small peptides like angiotensin 2. And it is by itself also a good predictor of worse outcome in septic shock patients. As you can imagine, if angiotensin II is degraded, it's not working as an endogenous vasopressor anymore, uh, and this is related to impaired outcome. But importantly, this is not something that is addressable by the antibody directed against, uh, against bioADM, because this is a completely different mechanism of action. So we decided to exclude patients with the elevated dose uh, concentration of DPP3 because this group of patients cannot be improving by adresizumab. So we used bioADM as an enrollment criterion to have patients with this uh, pathway being activated. And at the same time, if another pathway was also activated being DPP3, we use this as an exclusion criterion because this patient cannot benefit from the drug as it is a different mechanism. And when we do that in these exploratory analysis, we see that the benefit, the improvement of uh, SOFA score is more pronounced uh, in this group of patients. Uh, and then it also becomes significant and also the effect is more sustained as it is also there after six days. And if we look at the mortality, again, the effects appear more persistent. And this is especially on the right, uh, the effect on the short-term mortality during the first 14 days. And this is becoming borderline significant. So the next thing that we did is looking at the timing of administration of the study drug. So as you know, we had about uh, 250 patients that had uh, high bioADM levels, but low uh, DPP3 levels. And if we look at this group and we would actually cut them up in two halves, the median time until treatment with study drug was 8.3 hours. So if we look at the early treatment, half of that group below 8.3 hours, compare it to the later treatment above 8.3 hours, we could find out that indeed is it of any relevance uh, to treat patients earlier against later. And what we found again was that the treatment effect was more pronounced in this subgroup if they were treated earlier, as you can see on the left here, compared to the group that was treated later on. And this is also uh, becoming significant uh, after one day and also up to uh, six days uh, for the treatment group that was treated early on. And also for mortality, this effect is becoming much more pronounced uh, 
so the beneficial effects of treatment with the antibody uh, was associated with a much lower mortality rate in this group of patients, uh, as you can see here, compared to those patients that were treated late. So the conclusions of these exploratory analysis from the phase two trial and the whole bio-ADM pathway are the following. Bio-ADM, adrenomedulin, is a very relevant biomarker that is related to the outcome of sepsis patients. And the mechanism of action of this um, hormone is in actually be beneficial for capillary leakage and has having a detrimental effect on vascular tone. DPP-3 is a completely different biomarker and is also related to outcome of sepsis patients, but the mechanism here is that it is released from cells that die and that it induces uh, more hypotension and impaired outcome because it's actually an enzyme that can cut, for example, the phase suppressor or angiotensin 2. Adrecizumab is the antibody that is non-neutralizing for bio-ADM. It binds it. It's not inhibiting the action of the hormone, but the consequence of binding it is that it's actually containing the hormone into the circulation. And I, the results of that is that there is less endothelial permeability, and at the same time, there's less vasodilatory effects on the smooth muscle cells in the wall of the vascular uh, of, the, of the vessel. And so we found many positive clinical effects in preclinical animal models. And in the phase two study in patients with sepsis, we found that the drug is actually very safe and we have no issues uh, with safety at all. And at the same time, if you look at efficacy, we do uh, confirm the mode of action. I did not show you the data, but if we infuse the antibody, there's an acute increase in the bio-ADM concentrations in the circulation. And at the same time, we found uh, trends of benefit, improving organ dysfunction, improving SOFA score and mortality reduction. But these effects really become more pronounced if we have a further selection of patients. And we did it in two ways. And we showed that if you exclude a small proportion of patients, that have high DPP-3 concentrations, uh, a problem that is not addressable by the antibody, the effects become more pronounced. And also if the treatment is given early, uh, this effect is becoming more pronounced. Uh, and altogether, we think this is a very solid base to move on and to develop uh, the, uh, the knowledge that we have on this antibody in septic shock patients. Uh, and now prospectively look uh, into a group of patients that is treated early uh, and using both bio-ADM as an enrollment criterion and DPP-3 as an exclusion criteria to enrich the patient group that might benefit uh, from this treatment. And I think, and uh, we heard it in this uh, session many times, that really we are now in an age that we are actually uh, looking for enrichment of patient uh, cohorts and looking at the biological uh, plausibility for benefit of treatment and that future clinical trials will be more and more biomarker guided uh, to do so. So with that, I thank you for your kind attention and I'll be happy uh, to uh, answer uh, your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Peters. Um, a couple of questions here in the chat. Uh, so uh, do you think we should measure uh, just one time or after, before and after starting the treatments, or is your anesthetic, uh, or it's just an aesthetic uh, biomarker? No, so for prognosis, uh, there is, it's not a static biomarker. If you have an elevated level and it improves, your, di your prognosis is also good. If it's uh, not elevated or it is elevated and it stays high, then the prognosis is impaired. But for the study, we found indeed that we want to treat very early on, so we would not wait and do multiple measurements uh, for one thing. And the other thing is that if you give the antibody, we have an acute increase of the bio-ADM level. And this increase, we try to relate this to the beneficial effect, uh, but we could not find that. Uh, so it's not really useful, in my opinion, to measure uh, bio-ADM later on when the treatment is started. Uh, so for uh, actually 
giving the drug or give, making sure that this patient is likely to benefit, you would only need one uh, biomarker measurement. And if it's elevated, you can use it. If it's not elevated, then you might be wanting to follow it up because it might become elevated and that is related to an impaired prognosis and you might give the drug at that moment in time. Great. Well, thank you very much for your kind presentation and thank you everyone too uh, for the presentation. These this six uh, talks we just heard in this session for number 14. Um, a quick reminder, uh, we're about to end the session and we invite you to continue watching the other session. The, the session number 15 is ongoing right now. Uh, and do not forget that in the following weeks, we will upload the sessions to the World Sepsis Congress and the World Sepsis Day social networks in YouTube, podcast, and Facebook, Twitter, etc. And follow us. And remember to sign the Sepsis Declaration and the World, the, the World Sepsis Day or the GSA uh, websites. <clears throat> uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for signing and sharing the declarations. And Thank you very much also to the uh, sponsors. We have a lot of sponsors that make this uh, possible. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for all of them. Uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.